This Brigham Young University Idaho devotional address by President Henry J. Eyring was delivered September 13, 2022. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to fall semester. Sister Eyring and I are grateful for your faith and goodness. We have exciting things ahead of us. I appreciate the opportunity to gather with you in this devotional, which originates from Rexburg, but reaches around the world. For the first fall semester in several years, we hope to conduct the activities of the university as in the past. BYU-Idaho is spiritually and intellectually stronger than ever. But the world is in commotion. Nations are at war, and neighbors have discovered new differences that tax their friendships. Providentially, though, we members and supporters of this prophetic prophetically led university can be united in the way that matters most, namely living a life of consecration. When hearing the word consecration, I think of consecrated olive oil used to anoint people facing spiritual or physical challenges. This oil is made from choice olives. In ancient times, new kings of Israel were anointed with this sacred oil, a token of divine approval. We members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints recognize the power of consecration in our lives. We can draw upon it personally. Like the prophets and other faithful saints of the past, we can connect to divine revelation and power. In addition, we can lift others becoming what the scriptures call saviors on Mount Zion. With time and steady effort, our consecration can change the world for the better. In fact, this university continues to steadily improve. I was blessed in coming to Ricks College, the forerunner of BYU-Idaho, more than 50 years ago. Though I was just seven, entering the third grade at Lincoln Elementary and preparing to be baptized in the Rexburg Tabernacle, I felt I was in a special place. I continue to feel that way today. In hindsight, I can sense our Savior's loving hand in establishing a tiny pioneer school with just one room and a principal. Jacob Sporey, who spent a winter with his family in an unheated granary. It must have been daunting just to survive the snow and ice. In the first year of the school, there were only 59 students. St some paid tuition in the form of garden produce, such as sugar beets. When families of the students couldn't contribute even foodstuffs, Principal Sporey reduced his meager salary and worked on the railroad, sharing his wages with fellow teachers. Principal Sporey and his family survived, as did his successors. He had faith in the future of the school. He boldly declared, the seeds we are planting today will grow and become mighty oaks and their branches will run all over the earth. It was as if he and his colleagues could imagine BYU-Idaho as it is today. Jacob Sporey and his immediate successors would surely marvel at the BYU-Idaho campus and its global reach through hundreds of well-developed online courses which can increasingly be accessed via the internet. These courses make possible obtaining a degree while being far from Rexburg. Of course, our faculty and administrative staff work tremendously hard to reach out to our students wherever they are. 
In this, in many ways, we are blessed. Recently, while enjoying a family vacation, Sister Iring, several of our children, and I attended church away from Rexburg. We were among many visitors. I was impressed by the inspiring sacrament meeting addresses and an engaging Sunday school lesson. During that lesson, there was mention made of a family who were among the founders of what had been a small branch of the church there. This family had deep roots in the area, dating back to the 1880s. After the Sunday school lesson, I wanted to know more. From longtime members of what is now a ward, I learned that this family made a decent living thanks to a lumber and sawmill business. By the turn of the 20th century, the family had the good fortune to be granted a homestead by then-President Woodrow Wilson. Their 100-acre operation had a log cabin that served as their headquarters. They also grazed cattle on the property. The father was blessed with two hard-working sons, and their operations expanded. With the profits of the businesses, as well as property acquisition in the growing town, the brothers could have cashed out. In fact, they were tempted, but they wisely let their holdings grow in value. Then, many years later, when the family sold the business, the surviving brother walked into his bishop's office. Without explanation, he presented a tithing check to a member of the bishopric. This bishopric member looked at the check and said, You have too many zeros. The assumption was that the last two zeros on the check should have had a decimal point ahead of them. But the donor clarified that his do donation stood. There were not too many zeros, only several lifetimes of hard work, thrift, and good financial investment. The beneficiaries would be countless needy saints. This, however, is just half of the story. There was another family who gave their all to the branch, not through financial wealth, but through time and teaching. The head of this household was a man in his 70s. He was the faithful shepherd of a small flock of saints, roughly 50 women, men, teens, and children. This man was born during World War I. He graduated from college with a university degree, a rare thing in those days. He and his wife raised three children while he operated an insurance agency. When he retired, the two of them moved to a small town in the mountains. There they found a similarly sm small ward of the church, with members often coming and going. For the next five years, this faithful bishop was a dedicated spiritual leader, while also acting as the ward's chief cook and bottle washer. It was the equivalent of a full-time job. When he was released, the ward became a branch again, likely a disappointment after all that work. But he lived past the 100-year mark, providing selfless service. Though he and his beloved wife enjoyed 60 years of marriage, for the last 15 of those years he was a widower outliving not only her, but also their children. These stories remind me of the work of our consecrated BYU-Idaho employees. I have invited our dear friend, mathematics professor Richard Piper, to share some personal thoughts on the subject of consecration. Richard will be retiring at the end of this semester after 18 years of service at BYU-Idaho we have been richly blessed by his many contributions in faith. I have asked him to share important feelings about consecration.
I'm grateful to be invited by President Eyring to share a few minutes during his opening devotional this semester. For as long as I've known President Eyring, which includes before he became president, I've sensed a deep love that he has for you, the students of BYU-Idaho. If you haven't felt it, you either haven't been paying attention or you haven't spent enough time with him. <laughs> he may end up firing me for reinserting this remark into my talk after he struck it from the original draft. Uh, you know, following his characteristically humble way. But I felt that you needed to hear my witness of his love and concern for you. A story from the life of my great-grandfather's history inspires me and, and motivates me. See what elements of consecration you can find in this account. Heinrich Friedrich Christian Pieper, that's Piper, if you don't speak German. Uh, Chris, as he was known, was one of the first three people baptized in Cologne, Germany in this dispensation. This picture was taken the day of their baptism, August 4th, 1895. Grandpa Chris, is great grandpa Chris is standing on the far right. Chris met my great grandmother, Emma Frieda Alber, in the small branch in Frankfurt, and they were married in 1897. In 1900, Chris and Emma immigrated to Salt Lake City with my one-year-old grandfather, and shortly thereafter moved to Rexburg, Idaho, where there was a significant group of German immigrants. Chris worked as a stonecutter and helped with the construction of the original Spory building. He later served for 27 years as the caretaker of the Rexburg Tabernacle, where President Eyring was baptized. The oldest of Chris and Emma's eight children was my grandfather, Friedrich Wilhelm Pieper, or Bill. Bill was married uh, in August of 1917 and then lost his wife in April of 1918 to the Spanish flu, just months later, that swept the world that year. <clears throat> he remarried this time to my grandmother, Bertha Clara Myers. <clears throat> they had two children and were expecting a third when Bishop Henry Flam called Bill on a mission to Germany. Think about making that sacrifice. Bill's father, Chris, wrote in his life history, quote, times were difficult. I will never forget when we got word of the call my wife and I were in the garden. I was preparing the seed bed. She was planting the seed. Bill brought us word, word to us saying, they want me to go on a mission, but I haven't any money. Bill had just in the past month finished paying for a small two-room house, which he had built. As I heard him, I said, if you can leave your wife and two children behind for the gospel's sake, I'll help you with the necessary money. Chris continues, I said to Emma, it looks as though we won't be able to send Bill on a mission. 
The $50 a month that I get from the tabernacle is just enough to keep the family. You'll remember they had seven other children of their own at home. Suddenly, he says, a wonderful feeling came over me. I said, Ma, our boy has been called by the Lord. If he can call him on a mission, he can give me work. I won't give in to the old devil just because he tells me it can't be done. I'm sure I'll find enough work to do it. Then, in June 1921, I saw Bill off to, the salt, to salt Lake. I went from the railroad depot to the stake office building near where the tabernacle now stands, locked the door behind me, pulled the blinds, and got down on my knees to pray to my Father in heaven. I told him I hadn't given in to the evil one and, was on his, and that my son was on his way to fill, fulfill a mission. I petitioned him to open the way that I might get work. I must say that if I had ever prayed earnestly before, I did it now, for I was against a stone wall, so to speak. When I had finished, I left the stake office with the full faith that I would receive work. As I was passing the Conoco service station just a half block away on Main Street, Steve Skelton, who was working there, called to me. He said, you know, I spoke to you this spring about adding two rooms to my house. As I just now saw you passing, I was impressed that I ought to do that now and not wait till fall when the weather gets bad. I know my prayers were answered in getting work. Steve said, you know times are bad. Do you think you could work for 40 cents an hour instead of 50? I said, I'll work at any price. Close quote. Brothers and sisters, the consecration of my great-grandfather, Chris, and my grandfather, Bill, and their good wives and families brought a power into their lives that can come in no other way. Their blessings and the blessings enjoyed by their posterity are the beautiful fruits of consecration. The Lord always keeps his promises. I don't have time to tell you more stories about great grandpa Chris, but if any of you are interested, you can read more about him in my brother's October 2006 general conference talk. When it came time for me to serve a mission as a 19-year-old unmarried young man, how could I think I was even sacrificing anything to go? And considering Grandpa's story, at the end of December this year, it shouldn't be that difficult for me to walk away from a job that I just thoroughly love and away from my garden, and away from my 36 going on 39 wonderful grandchildren to serve a 23-month senior mission. We're waiting for our call as we speak. Why, I even get to take my wife and our daughter, Sarah, with me when I go. I want to close by testifying of the consecrated life of the prophet Joseph Smith and of the ultimate example of consecration in the Savior Jesus Christ. May all these examples, and especially those given to each of you individually by the Holy Ghost, inspire and, and unify us in our consecrated efforts to stay on the covenant path is my humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Thank you, Brother Piper. We love you. Living past the century mark is rare, though President Nelson is now just two years from that milestone. Already, he has lived longer than any modern-day church president. He also presides over more saints than ever before. Yet history shows that some prophets, especially those of the Old Testament, were consecrated by their loneliness as outcasts and even martyrs. Perhaps the saddest of these prophets was Jeremiah, who was Israel's prophet for nearly 50 years, serving five kings from Josiah to Zedekiah. Jeremiah was inspired and powerfully bold. According to Jewish tradition, he authored the books of Jeremiah, 1st and 2nd Kings, and Lamentations. Jeremiah was the son of Hilkiah, a priest from the land of Benjamin. The difficulties he encountered, as described, especially in the books of Jeremiah and Lamentations, have prompted Bible scholars to refer to him as the weeping prophet. According to Old Testament scholars, Jeremiah was called to prophesy of the impending destruction of Jerusalem due to Israel's worshiping of idols and making human sacrifices. He was guided by God to proclaim that the nation of Judah would suffer famine, foreign conquest, plunder, and captivity in a land of strangers. Not surprisingly, Jeremiah's enemies retaliated. King Zedekiah was merciful, declining popular pressure to put him to death. Yet Zedekiah's compromise was almost as bad. Jeremiah was imprisoned in a cistern where he sank into mud and seemed fated to starve. Redemption came, though, through a surprising source, a man named Ebed Melech, an Ethiopian official in Zedekiah's court, likely risked his life by pleading for Jeremiah's release. Jeremiah reciprocated with a promise that Ebed Melech would not fall by the sword during the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. The bravery of Ebed Melech was willing to put his life on the line for Jeremiah, making me think of my angel mother, Kathleen Johnson Eyring. She was born with a love of life and love of other people. As a young woman, she embodied an unusual combination of spirituality and spunk. She liked sports, especially tennis and tended to, tended to drive fast. As a result, she was acquainted with the officials at the local traffic court. <laughs> she also loved learning and teaching. Reading and writing were her favorite hobbies. As a young boy, I cherished bedtime, reading on mother's large bed or my narrower one. She was particularly good at bringing to life the voices of the characters in our stories. Above all else, though, Mother loved our Savior and His gospel. Learning and teaching the principles of the gospel was a lifelong passion. She knew the scriptures and the teachings of the living prophets, as well as those of the leaders of the auxiliary organizations. She became the mother of four boys, born in just nine years. I am the oldest. When we were young, growing up in Rexburg and then Bountiful, Utah, she was both our mother and one of the guys. I don't recall ever beating her on the tennis court. Even my father had to work hard to match her strokes. After the birth of my youngest brother, John, in 1972, there was a long period of miscarriages and associated sadness when the four of us boys, with the four of us boys away at school during the weekdays, mother ministered to near neighbors and extended relatives. 
She also wrote children's books, one of which won a statewide literature prize. But then, after many years, we four boys were joined by two sisters. Mother's novel writing and the boys' Saturday projects turned toward bread making, flower gardening, and watercolor painting. However, as you may have heard me say before, the days of homemade bread, fresh cut flowers from the garden, and watercolors didn't last as we had planned. Mother's health began to fail. It was not a problem of physical strength. Even now, when I take her hand, I'm painfully reminded of the strength she developed through decades of hitting tennis balls hard at dad on the other side of the net. The usual result was what my brothers like to say, another winner, mom. At the risk of discomforting President Eyring, I must acknowledge how princely he treats my mother. Theirs is a continuing romance that exceeds any of the movies they have watched time and again over the years. That can be seen and felt in this statement that mother made at Ricks College in 1976 while introducing my father in a public gathering. She said this, one of the things that impressed me most about him was that he loved the Lord and he loved him enough to show this love by great service at the expense of worldly honors. He didn't seek the honor of men as he sought the love of the Lord." Close quote. That said, President Eyring has always known that he got the better half when marrying mother. There is no one more devoted to our Savior. She has personified consecration throughout her life, and Dad has stayed close, especially during this time in which she might shrink. You may be similarly blessed by a mother, wife, or other woman with such loving consecration. Sister Kelly Eyring is such a woman. In fact, when I read the parable of the Good Shepherd and study the lives of spiritual heroines such as Mary, the mother of our Lord, there is a desire to be like them. As President Russell M. Nelson declared 33 years ago during his service in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he said, quote, a worthy woman personifies truly noble and worthwhile worthwhile attributes of life." Close quote. We men can be similarly consecrated good shepherds. The key is to give our all to the giver of eternal life. As we consecrate ourselves, he can lift us heavenward. May we all do our part. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For more information about this program, please visit the BYU-Idaho website at byui.edu devotionals.